Hello and welcome to week three of our lectures in group and organisational communication. Today's lecture I've called Thinking because we're going to be looking at two particular thinking processes that have a significant impact on communication and thus our particular interest in group and organisation. These are two thinking processes that are scientific, meaning there is a body of work around them, they've been analysed, there's data to prove certain outcomes, and they are predictive, predictive of decision making and outcomes of a group. And um, I'm hoping that this is a lecture that is foundational in the sense that it builds a, a body of knowledge for you around the processes. But as with all of the lectures of this course, I'm keen for you to read around the subject as you will need to, both for your general understanding, the implications for communication, looking at those, and also the assignments that are associated with this course that require you to look for papers on these particular topics and read around the topics and read around how they're applied to various situations. So here we see two images and I've put these up on a slide to act as metaphors for two types of thinking process that we're going to be talking about today. Um, a metaphor of course is only a partial explanation and we can always think of ways in which the metaphor doesn't quite work but I'd like you to just come along with me uh, with this idea that the funnel on the left is a metaphor for a kind of thinking which we're going to be referring to which is actually a negative kind of thinking where all of these ideas um, that emerge around a boardroom table for example and then the communication that follows actually results in a decision that isn't a good one but happens because of certain circumstances. The image on the right um, I would like for you to see as a positive one even though it's a volcanic eruption and obviously there's a lot of negative and destructive things that we can think about with respect to that but it's a kind of thinking process which actually produces uh, an expansion, an explosion, if you like, of ideas. And uh, the image on the right, actually, for us, in terms, in, in terms of thinking about the thought processes, is one that I'm going to say is neutral at this point. It's just a metaphor for something that is actually happening. And we're going to tease out the value of these two ideas uh, as the lecture goes along. So the first kind of thinking that we're looking at with this funnel metaphor is actually referred to as groupthink. It is a theory in which groups naturally look for consensus and will, as a result of looking for consensus, actually come up with false consensus even when individual members disagree. So I've put up these two images to reference groupthink in two different ways. One, a group of soldiers where everyone's marching and following each other, even if it doesn't seem like the best idea. And the second being uh, this image of sheep. And if anyone's ever watched sheep being herded, you know uh, the sheepdog pretty much needs to guide the first sheep and all the rest follow. So just to be clear, we're not talking about groupthink that is positive on the left and negative on the right. And that's why I'm asking, why might this be bad? Groupthink is always a negative situation. We can later, and will later rather, talk about groupthink that is impacted positively, meaning people don't get drawn into this consensus thinking um, when they think better of it. They're able to challenge it. And we can talk about groupthink that's negatively impacted, meaning it is 
you know, the consensus is further and further ingrained. So these two images both reference groupthink, both describe a type of consensus where people disagree, but they just um, uh, they uh, they disagree, but agree to go along with what is being said and what is being asked of them. So I think it's uh, good to get a historical perspective on where this theory comes from and who originated it. So um, as the slide shows, it originated in 1972 and it the main person associated with this theory of groupthink is Irvin Yanis, a Yale psychologist who worked in areas of decision making around dieting and smoking. So let me just read the quote to you that is attributed to him. The advantages of having decisions made by groups are often lost because of powerful psychological pressures that arise when the members uh, who work closely together share the same set of values and above all face a crisis situation that puts everyone under intense stress. So we're going to unpack that as we talk about how groupthink comes about. But um, I have a quote here from uh, Paltz and Forer. From a, 19, uh, from a 2013 paper, and it says, when people who approach problems or issues as a collective group, no matter what the facts are, instead of acting and thinking as individuals, they look for this consensus. So it's really this idea of being uh, carried along by maybe a dominant voice of some sort, or um, you know, not being able to speak up. And we will look at what the conditions are according to to Yanis that led to or that leads to this kind of thinking and some of the situations that have been um, described as being impacted by by groupthink but just to say uh, that during his career when Yanis was looking at decision making um, his work described how people responded to threats as well as the conditions that give rise to irrational complacency, apathy, hopelessness, rigidity, and panic. He also apparently made some um, really important contributions to the study of group dynamics, as you will be hearing. And um, I have a quote that is attributed to, I think it's um, Ports and, uh, and Fora again, but it says, groupthink describes a tendency of groups to minimize conflict and reach consensus, which we've been saying, without sufficiently testing, analyzing, and evaluating their ideas. So this is from, from Yanis, that his work suggests that in trying to reach consensus, in, in reaching conformity, there are a number of kinds of things that are happening with the thinking. One, there's a bias in the analyses. So people are coming up with ideas, and then because of this need to come to a consensus they're kind of skewing the way they analyze the information maybe in you know assuming uh, a certain kind of context or assuming um, you know certain priorities they there is also a tendency in those groups to promote simplistic and stereotyped thinking which you can understand and, and quite easily imagine so you know you have an idea around a table that you know, X causes Y, and, you know, there's a bias, there's maybe a, a, a contextual bias, a circumstance, it's the time and place where people think this is, this is the way. They then have a limited kind of analysis, or it's skewed in some way, and when people do try to, you know, put forward independent and individual ideas, they are squashed because they are just not the dominant voice, they're not where the consensus is at. So as I noted in the previous slide, groupthink actually emerged as a theory in 1972, which means that in the lead up to it, Yanis was doing research and thinking about what was happening with decision making and the kind of context of decision making. 
that was actually producing bad decisions even when there was uh, good information out there. So what was, what was actually the cause of this? So it's no surprise that the context for Yanis's research and analysis was war and conflict. And so the three images on this slide show the Vietnam War on the left, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, which was 1941 in the middle, and Fidel Castro on the right, um, in reference to the 1961 Bay of Pigs invasion. So in 1955-75 was the Vietnam War, and there was an escalation of war, and it resulted in a Cold War by proxy that went on for 20 years, even though America had thought that it would be a short, um, a short conflict and, you know, the army would go in and come out. Uh, that did not happen. That did not happen. The middle image, which shows the attack on Pearl Harbor, was an attack by Japan in Hawaii. Now, apparently Washington had actually intercepted messages that there was going to be an attack. So they were well informed in the sense that they had um, intercepted the uh, intelligence that, that gave them all the ammunition to prevent this from happening by either countering or having, I guess, uh, surface to air missiles or some kind of mechanism for preventing um, these, these um, bombs from, from landing. But apparently there was an overestimation in Washington of their ability, uh, an overestimation of Washington's ability, America's ability to actually, you know, um, prevent this. They really thought that Japan would never start a war um, because they realized that Japan wasn't going to win that war, or they calculated that Japan would, would see it that way. But actually, Japan's attack was merely designed to prevent a US attack on Asian interests. And I guess it was just a miscalculation on the part of America with respect to how the um, this uh, Asian military power would, would react. The 1961 Bay of Pigs invasion was an attack by Cuban exiles who opposed Fidel Castro, and it was supported by the US government. And clearly that also was one of those conflict situations that Yanis was looking at uh, and examining the kind of stressful decision-making uh, pressure cooker environments that produced a poor quality thinking, let's say. I'm including this video here and the link is below for you to watch it um, because it is an interesting social experiment. It is not, however, a demonstration of groupthink in the sense that it is not caused by the uh, one of the requirements, which is this uh, kind of high stress environment. However, I want you to watch the video and listen to what people say afterwards, because that certainly is one of the uh, contextual situations that um, is party to causing groupthink. I personally want to disagree, by the way, that most people are sheep. I actually don't think that's true um, because groupthink actually reveals there are conditions that produce these outcomes. But of course, there are many situations where people are able to work against that desire for a consensus. But we are really um, focused when we talk about groupthink on the stressful environments that actually result in these kinds of decision making. So wasn't that video fascinating? This idea of herd thinking or herd mentality, the fact that in that waiting room, people were willing to follow what somebody else was doing without even knowing why they were doing it. So I have put this picture up of a random road because I wanted to remember to tell you a story um, about what happens on the Taruba Link Road by San Fernando Tech, um, or where that used to be rather, it's now UTT, where two lanes of traffic actually form three lanes, um, 
to turn onto the link road and to go straight ahead if you're heading into San Fernando or take the far right lane and come back round the roundabout and come into Marabella. So would you say this is herd thinking? This kind of forming multiple lanes on the road, not this image, this is just some random uh, car and road image. So I would argue that really what we're talking about when we refer to herd thinking is the kind of peer pressure and um, it's unconscious and it has no rationale that you can logically say is why you're, why you're doing something. On a road, however, when you're following rules, I would not say that you are following the herd. Um, those are rules that are, are designed to help you know kind of maintain safety there's a there's a rationale for them and even if you're not thinking about them in the moment consciously you've certainly understood as a driver um, what those rules are and the fact that they're important for you to follow and unless everyone follows them there are going to be accidents and of course you know there are accidents for various reasons including including issues like that and others so this is just to say, when we talk about following other people, we are actually looking at one of the, what is called an antecedent to group thinking. But because we're having to think about decision making within uh, an organisational context, the basis for following someone and maybe following the group needs to be framed in a slightly different way. And I just wanted to put this up to illustrate a contrast to, to what we're talking about. So here's a quote uh, from a paper by Yanis, which is 10 years after his first um, published work on groupthink. And I want to read it to you because it contains some of the language that we're going to start to use to think about the components of groupthink and then talk to you about what happens with uh, all good theory, which is that other people work with it, they augment it, they critique it, and therefore, you know, these ideas are not static. But what Yanis said was that uh, groupthink is a mode of thinking that people engage in when they're deeply involved in a cohesive in-group. Now we mentioned that in group at the very beginning of this lecture series when we were talking about uh, small group and identity. But um, he says when those members are striving from, for uh, unanimity and that overrides their motivation to realistically appraise alternative courses of action. Um, so as I said at the beginning of this lecture when talking about um, groupthink, of course, there are um, very valid criticisms of this being a complete answer as to, to what's going on. And also, maybe, um, you know, uh, you might have methodological queries about how data is collected and whether or not that can be truly said to be causative of a certain kind of outcome. So what Rose said is... Uh, one must wonder, A, why groups ever reach rational informed decisions, and B, why so many group discussions are marked by acrimony, divisiveness, vituperative debate, turf battles, etc. And there is a really good review article, which I'm going to include in the citations, uh, from Rose, who is a critic of some of the, I guess, writing about uh, groupthink and it's often not that uh, you know a critic is trying to completely rubbish an idea they just he or she when i say they if it's multiple um this you know individuals just have other ideas about what is what is really at the basis for um, a particular outcome and as i said may not completely agree that the causation has been proven by certain kinds of analysis. 
So here are the antecedents of groupthink, i.e. the conditions required um, to likely generate groupthink. The idea of cohesion, and I've put trust and loyalty there, but another one might be this um, idea of favouritism or nepotism even. Uh, secondly, organisational structural uh, faults. And one example is this idea of a top-down manager who is applying pressure and therefore you know, doesn't really give you space to think, or there are rules and regulations that restrict the way in which you think. And then situational factors, uh, such as a deadline. Now, when Yanis was initially publishing in, in 72, um, there was already uh, a desire to apply that work to various other situations and see whether it held true. And actually, within eight years, there was the beginnings of the publishing of a criticism of groupthink, saying it, it was, you know, right to, to a degree or right in certain ways. And I'm going to talk about that now. So the criticisms really started with Longley and Pruitt in 1980. But I'm going to include in the citations a link by a... Um, of a paper by Robert Barron, who in 2005 said... Essentially, Yanis was right about the uh, situation of groupthink, but wrong about the antecedent conditions. And so we're going to look at Barron's uh, concept of what produces groupthink. But just to um, explain a little bit about what Barron was thinking about, he was actually considering this notion of a structural fault within an organisation and... Um, he says that if you think about a problem such as worrying if your job is going to be safe, that is a particular kind of stress. It's a kind of procedural in some ways because you're concerned that if you don't uh, get something done supposedly efficiently, uh, you may end up losing that job. And that's, you know, you could imagine in... I mean, using our current times as an example, you could imagine the increased pressure because of increased unemployment, for example. So he identified, Baron that is, some structural faults. And he, uh, I'm going to quote three things that he, he identified. One of them is this idea of a meaningful threat. So that could be like a uh, job loss, for example. He said homogeneity of values were also an issue. Um, so a mixture that's homogenous is the same throughout. And so, in a sense, this is the opposite of diversity. And that's something that we're going to come back to. And then thirdly, there was another structural fault, which is group insulation, meaning that um, if groups are shut off from external expertise, for example, it can cause real problems with the decision-making because it doesn't, uh, take into account the best information, for example. So we have these three antecedent conditions and then the criticisms by individuals that, um, you know, in real life situations, uh, the ways in which decision making was made, the problematic decision making didn't really happen in the ways that Yanis was explaining through um, his particular data. Thus far, we've been talking about the conditions that can lead to groupthink, but let's pin it down and look at what an organisation might look like where groupthink is a likely outcome because of uh, some of the situations with, within that organisation. So some of the structural faults that we can think about, meaning the things that are already built into the idea of the organisation, are these. Um, the first one is the insulation from expertise. So we can think about all kinds of expertise, communication, policy, finance. And you could well imagine um, organisations that are either small, don't have access, don't have the financial or uh, access or, or vision even, that do not seek a broader thinking and therefore you get this um, funnel kind of thinking which... Uh, we're, we're really referring to when thinking about groupthink. Secondly, a leadership that is actually partial. It has 
in it um, the thinking of an intended outcome, a desired outcome, and therefore uh, individuals in that company aren't really free to approach a situation the way they might want to. And these are, you know, kind of real life situations. So uh, you, you could imagine them happening in an organisation. The lack of methodological clarity simply says that, you know, the rules aren't clear or they're not understood well. And you can therefore imagine a situation where thinking is uh, confused because of that. And then this homogeneity of social backgrounds, which we've already mentioned, this idea there isn't really a particular diversity. And so with all of these, we get a kind of narrowing of, of ideas and you can see the way the funnel is a useful metaphor. I've taken this from a particular paper, um, which was an analysis in Florida of a department, and it just provides a useful example, which is why I'm including it here, and we'll refer to it in a moment. I'm including this here because I think it important and interesting to contrast the consequences of groupthink with defective decision-making or DDM. And we're going to be talking about decision-making just now. But um, alongside the false consensus that leads to the bad decision, we have some repercussions to groupthink. Um, and these are, these are them, the idea of morality or moralizing, so coming up with a uh, an idea of what is good and bad, stereotyping, which is obviously a particular kind of bias, and self-censorship. So just uh, to expand on this for a moment, we can imagine in our small group where a decision is being made, where there's a particular time pressure, there's the trust and loyalty, maybe there's a another kind of structural issue that, we're, that we have already spoken about. Um, in order to come up with a quick decision, there are biases that are uh, inherent within the thinking, and the output, of course, is stereotype thinking that's further kind of cemented, if you like. Also self-censorship, uh, meaning that we get to a situation where a group, having made a decision, um, has to kind of continue to justify it, and therefore cuts out any kind of self-criticism or analysis. When we're talking about decision-making, we are talking about some slightly different things, um, and those are things like uh, poor understanding of the objectives. So what are the requirements of the decision itself? Um, and obviously there's a, the symptom is the decision is made and therefore the objectives have not been considered um, and so the, the thinking is that, uh, or the thinking kind of precludes um, any kind of critical awareness because they're just completely missed. Um, poor information gather gathering, meaning that as the decision is made, it means that no more information is sought in order to uh, further analyse the situation. No plan B, effectively. There's... Uh, no other way in which this could could be could be thought of and uh, while the distinctions might seem um, acute I think it's important to just talk about the the fact that groupthink results in a certain kind of stereotyping and output and decision making doesn't necessarily produce a kind of stereotyping because it doesn't have the same kind of structural um, basis that results in the um, processing of information. And we're going to talk about that in a, in a moment. So I just want to return to this idea of positive impact and negative impact on groupthink, which I mentioned at the beginning, and talk about a couple of things on the slide here and a couple of things that I want to read to you from particular papers. So we can talk, as I said, about a positive impact on groupthink, meaning that it's lessened, and that is when you can imagine environments where individuals in a group do actually challenge each other, 
and they you know verbalize their disagreements and seek solutions so that's groupthink being positively impacted meaning the consensus is lessened the the damaging consensus is lessened and we can talk about a negative impact on groupthink um, and this study here on the on the on the slide is one about a court uh, environment in which the well, it says the mentality of the workplace discourages kind of intelligent discourse and client centeredness um, because there is this loyalty in the court structure and the court culture. One can imagine, I think, in a court environment that everyone who comes in is seen as bad and negative um, in the same way that newspapers are sites for conflict and often discuss discussion of information in this binary context because that's how news works you know if you become aware of those kinds of things if you develop a certain kind of literacy towards them you can start to see how the stereotyping kind of sets in and therefore has these negative consequences um, just to read to you a couple of other studies that were done which i think are important and interesting and one was with students who were middle grade and they were given a task in a computer lab and library area and one group was given resources in order to collaborate and another wasn't, meaning they weren't given computer access for example. And it was found, hopefully as you would expect, that those students who actually had external sources of information and did their own information gathering used the computers, they actually performed better in quizzes and in information gathering tasks uh, when they were when they were tested um, to talk about a medical situation as well I think we have a slightly different set of criteria that we can think about that we can um, refer to as being impacted by groupthink and this was a situation where a carer a, a wife was looking after her husband and um, she asked for support from the healthcare team and the husband didn't want to leave home um, and so the doctors and nurses when considering that situation rather than actually you know kind of deliberating it and seeking this client centeredness seeking the patient's best interest they ultimately decided that he should be put in a care home because he wasn't seen as you know compliant so I think what this points to is the fact that if you have uh, information that is seeming to set up a, a disagreement um, in order to work out in order to work away from ending up with a false consensus you really need to seek more information you need to interrogate the situation why does he not want to leave home uh, why is the wife trying to get additional care to keep him at home um, and when that isn't done you can just get decisions being made without the um, without the uh, client's awareness or without their full kind of uh, integration into the into the ideas so we can talk about positive impact on groupthink and negative impact and um, generally the positive impacts on groupthink mean that individuals in that group actually seek to correct errors they uncover presuppositions and identify new ideas and um, i think by having this theory that we can lean on this idea of the antecedents and the symptoms we can actually start to think about the benefit of having discussion two or more individuals working in a group uh, rather than an individual working alone we can see how this would have a positive impact Now, because groupthink is a thinking process that can happen within an organisation and we have such diversity of organisations that we can think about, we need to, in some ways, talk about the communication by implication because, of course, the communication processes are also highly diverse and um, meaning that they're varied across different kinds of organisation. Well, one of the things I think we can do is 
use the concepts of communication or from communication to talk about ways of mitigating groupthink. And the five images across the bottom of the screen are five key things that we can do to ensure groupthink doesn't happen. So the first is clearly this concept of feedback. In a groupthink environment, a decision is being made without the uh, multiple voices and without looking at the information in uh, rich ways and thinking about the processes that are leading to a narrow kind of thinking. Feedback is just one communication mechanism where obviously you're taking information from the system and putting it back into your thinking. So it's everything from customer service, responses, to um, employee satisfaction. Um, it's about, um, you know, customers indicating um, how things work for them, where they, where they didn't work, you know, analyses of customers, analyses of audiences, that kind of thing. Once you start to include that, you are obviously, you know, um, incorporating that information into the decision making. The second image is an owl on a stack of books um, in reference to thinking about the expertise of thinking about uh, diversity of voices and um, vision really because it comes from a place of superior knowledge as we were saying when you don't include expert information you have a narrow kind of thinking the third thing is the diversity in the workplace. As I was saying, when you have a homogenous workplace where the values are narrow, you're obviously not thinking about um, the breadth of the audience that you're serving. Um, and those people aren't featured and thought about um, within the organization. Diversity can be all manner of things. It could be age, gender, uh, social class, um, and all the other, all the other uh, obvious kind of categories that we think about. When you actually have that diversity, this is why it works in order to prevent a kind of narrow thinking because you're literally taking the voices of a broad audience. Uh, the fourth image refers to goal setting and long and short term goals. If you actually have an organisation in which you structure um, the kind of objectives in terms of time, in terms of a timeline, things that you achieve and desire in the short term and things that are going to take longer, you actually start to compartmentalise the ways in which you are making decisions. And that is going to be good because it's a narrowing of the objectives and a narrowing and, uh, or if not narrowing, an improvement of the method for actually coming up with your answers. So that's very important. Uh, the last image is of the devil's advocate, and that's because anytime you think about alternatives to solutions that you are coming up with, uh, you're actually incorporating a new kind of thinking. You're incorporating more information uh, thinking about the possible consequences. So all of these communication um, features that we can think about and we can think about and know about in very kind of general terms, we can apply them to improvements of organisational thinking to limit groupthink. Now there is a bit of a problem when talking about a big concept like groupthink within the concept of uh, its impact on group and organisation and then talking about the communication almost by implication because uh, we're not able to pinpoint specific examples since they're so numerous and to start to go into them would just bring up so much diversity and complexity that it almost becomes um, too much information. So that's why we're approaching it in this way and talking about the concept and you know you can clearly see how the communication is impacted. You should look for specific papers. And in fact, you will have to look for specific papers to write your queries. And that's why the query assignment is present. But I want to use this example
and I am going to include the link of this particular analysis in the citations. I must say, um, I think in the case of this particular paper, uh, in talking about it now, I'm going to save you the effort of reading it because it wasn't the most beautifully written paper and therefore it took some effort to go through. So this was a situation in Florida of a particular administration and the information on the slide represents the the um, audience, the size of the audience, the residents, 86,000 residents were being served by 800 staff, a mayor and seven managers and they had bad records meaning that they often weren't present and they set out rules but these rules weren't properly enforced or maintained or explained. So what do you think was one of the major problems with the actual um, delivery of service? I don't think it is too far, you don't, I don't think you have very far to look to see that the leadership was bad and as a result of that bad leadership it created immense kinds of problems. In fact it was regarded as having a bad culture of customer service. And let's look at the next slide that explains some of the things that, that people said because there were uh, numerous interviews that were done, thousands of people were surveyed, um, there were structured interviews, all kinds of uh, elements to the, to the methodology of this research. And here we can get, in the next slide we'll get to see what people said. So this slide actually shows some of the things that the analyst said, having surveyed staff and looked at the way the operation of the um, service was being provided. Uh, the analyst said the office got along pretty well and they had a common enemy in the new manager that seemed to unite them. Now we'll, we'll come to the positives and negatives of this in terms of a um, structural uh, situation within an organization but I mean often conflict is not going to be a good thing. Um, so after working through the organizational behavior it was apparent that resistance to change was entrenched. So what happened was the researchers were required to survey the staff of the council. I'm not sure if that's the term that they use in America but let's let's just stick with council for now. So they surveyed the the members of this council who were um, delivering this, um, uh, delivering the public utilities and they were pretty resistant to improving what had been going on because this was a survey I think that went over all the recorded data for a number of years and it indicated a kind of gradual but systematic um, decline in the way the, the officers were, were functioning. And uh, so the outcome was, and this was the thinking of the, the researchers, that change would need to be dictated by a manager without further input from office personnel. Now, the reason I've put this study in is because one would think all along that in order to improve the uh, situation around groupthink, in order to minimise it, one would need to, you know, uh, have organisations undergo structural changes, um, look at improving diversity, uh, incorporating feedback, bringing in experts and all of those kinds of things. And the, 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 the actual finding of this particular paper was that sometimes that is just not the way. Change takes a long time. As I'm sure you're all aware, when you think about organisation you can imagine uh, how much slower it takes than, um, you know, motivating and organising an individual. And even if you think about your own motivations as an individual, it can take a long time to get to where you want to be. Change doesn't happen uh, quickly in a lot of, a lot of uh, instances. So the first thinking was, of course, there could be a management initiative and that there could be, you know, a long-term plan to improve customer service. Um, and when the researchers looked at the organisational culture, there was a problem with the formal structures. The policy itself was flawed. Um, for whatever reason, 
the the way the policy was designed it wasn't actually serving the needs of the particular residents informally how things operated things were also flawed i think there was a lot of um, the office layout was pretty bad and um, resources were limited and therefore things that should have taken a very short period of time um, in terms of filing and access to to data following up on customer services all of those things were were bad and they weren't part of just the formal structure they were part of the informal structure because staff had been there so long they were actually you know they developed systems they were doing things their own way they were doing essentially what I was talking about earlier with the two lanes of traffic becoming three lanes by uh, UTT in in South where people develop their own ways of coping because the provisions that are set up are just not serving um, not serving the needs essentially now the social element of the actual office environment was actually good in a way in that you know, members of staff actually got along pretty well, but the fact that they had a common energy, em, enemy in the manager obviously is not going to be a good thing. Not really. I mean, it served, you know, academically, it served to say that the social function, you know, had a kind of positive or an, up, an upside to it. But really, if it's uh, united against something negative, ultimately, that's not going to be a good, um, a, a good situation. So... You know, thinking about the way this uh, council worked, we can imagine this classical organisation, this kind of structure with the various hierarchies and various layers of power. And it was realised that the, you know, strong kind of, or the, sorry, the management initiative was not the way to go and they needed a nuclear option, which is for a new team to come in and literally dictate direction and say okay these are the new policies let's work through changing them this is what's happening from henceforth and anyone who doesn't comply is eventually going to find themselves out of the organization one way or the other um, and i don't know a significant amount about it but apparently american employment law is such that it's very easy to get rid of people in work environments so this worked in that particular situation so let's let's just end uh, this slide by saying it's not always the case that the talking about it and the short and the long-term kind of initiatives uh, and workshops are going to be the way through it where you've got such a kind of um, entrenched bad system such as this one Now, I promised earlier that we're going to talk about Baron, who um, proposed three different antecedent conditions to groupthink. And the reason I want to end this kind of groupthink part of the lecture with this model, uh, this ubiquity model, is because I actually think it reflects a change from when Yanis was doing his work to today, which I think is really um, interesting in organisation. If you think about it, um, as I have done, and maybe you'll share my thinking, maybe you won't, but during the time of Yanis's work in the 70s, um, the organisations he was looking at were government and um, state organisations. And I think in those kinds of classical organisations, maybe even to today, there is a significant amount of bureaucracy and they work in certain certain ways, which we are probably all quite familiar with um, as being at the receiving end of some of those kind of systems. But I think, um, if you think about Barron's model being 2005, that in the you know 35 years or so since Yanis was working, Barron proposed a set of conditions that were actually less about the structure and more about the way the organization fit together socially so i think if you think about today and um this being you know um what almost 
15 years on from from when Barron came up with his model, you're actually thinking again of a, a change in the way people think about being employed and think about employment. And I, I'm certain because of the COVID situation and this current pandemic, people are thinking about employment in different ways as well, meaning that there's a shift towards entrepreneurship and um, being kind of self-directed, working from home, working in organisations in, in ways that you know, wouldn't have been allowed before, but actually now, you know, people are having to function uh, in these new ways. Um, but also, when people talk about millennials and what they look for in jobs, it's not the same kinds of things, the long-term career and um, focus on remuneration alone. Those kinds of things are not what the research shows millennials are particularly interested in in the work environment. Um, there's a greater emphasis on diversity, um, a greater uh, focus on um, other kinds of benefits of the work environment, thinking about kind of the ethical environment and a need to serve, uh, if not humanity, community, a much more compassionate way of being and thinking. So all of this is to say that when Yanis was working, I think he was thinking about particular structures in organisation and the focus was on power in that way and when Barron's model um, emerged the focus was really on something different it was really on as I said social location social interaction relational kind of communication and the ways in which people uh, think and interact in in different ways in the workplace or differently then in 2005 from the 1970s. So these are the things that Barron identified. He identified uh, three antecedent conditions. And, you know, if you go back to the slide that looks at what um, Yanis proposed, you'll, you'll see the ways in which Yanis is a structural and these are not, in, in my estimation at least. I, they feel more relational and um, psychological in some ways. So the first one is the social identification and individuals feel part of an in-group, which is what Yanis had said, but um, you see here the social identification has this shared and vested interest and that really wasn't uh, included in Yanis' thinking. This uh, suggestion of salient norms, so the ways things are actually done, the culture almost of an organisation. And again, we're looking, if you look at the first um, bullet point, values outweigh risk. So there's a sense of a kind of common goal that can make people um, actually end up not diversifying their thinking. It can be, it can be a negative situation because they're you know the, the the collective thinking is actually not real is actually not um, considering the, the the detriment and the downsides. Okay, so this is Barron's third uh, antecedent condition that leads to groupthink, and it is this idea of low self-efficacy, uh, which is a lack of self-confidence among group members to actually achieve a certain task. Now, one of the things we can do is talk about generations in the workplace. And if we think about the generation that's called millennial, so I guess um, employees probably under the age of 35 or so, um, the research shows that this is a generation of which many of you are probably part, um, but this is a generation that is regarded as having a focus on ethical business, being more compassionate, but on a, on a downside, maybe not having as much emotional resilience. So the world's pressures have changed, as we all, as we all know. And if you think about the kind of corporate environment, many of the power holders within big business, I guess, will be, you know, older, older individuals. So people in their 50s, let's say, they, they've grown up in a different generation, and they have a vested interest in things working um, the way they're used to them working. Um, or, or maybe it's just a kind of an entrenched thinking. So this low self-efficacy, the lack of confidence, lack of um, 
self-assurance and an, an ability to achieve a certain task can come about because the actual uh, needs of the company haven't changed around the actual employees. So the new employees coming in uh, are faced with certain conditions within an organisation which are you know, not in alignment with their particular values. So anyway, we have all kinds of um, situations that actually uh, kind of, um, uh, they amount to low self-efficacy. Things like fatigue, uh, negative feedback within the, within the workplace environment. So if you're in an environment where your bosses aren't particularly supportive, if you're in a, maybe a government environment, let's say, where there are certain systems in place that aren't like the corporate environment um, and you feel like you're not being listened to or not being heard because you're part of a classical organisation which has this hierarchy, it can be really jarring and you know individuals can feel like they're not being heard. Um, one of the things that's often stated, and Barron states this, of the analysis of uh, groupthink is that um, there's a kind of a laboratory analysis and the real world situation isn't actually properly taken into account. So when an analyst goes in, when a researcher goes in and is examining uh, an office environment, because of the compartmentalization or the type of methodology that's being used to capture the data, you'll find actually um, it takes a very narrow perspective and doesn't really consider all of the other other pressures which is where this brings us full circle the initial um, complaints about the way groupthink was being laid out and being stated came from Okay, so here we are in the second part of our lecture. This is much shorter, it's just four slides. And I'm returning to Catherine Miller as a main source of information for this part of the lecture, in which we're looking at decision-making processes and how they come about. So groupthink is a particular explanation for a type of decision-making process that we're obviously saying is flawed. We're going to look at other kinds of decision-making processes. So we have here the description of two kinds of thinking and two models that offer us uh, an explanation for various processes of thinking and decision making. We already know from Yanis that groupthink makes decision making less thorough. Now when we actually look at desirable decision making, I guess, rather than the um, defective decision making that we were talking about before, um, we can talk about two kinds of models, the rational model and the optimizing model. Now the rational model is informed by classical theory, as it says, and classical theory is just one type of theory that describes the way organizations work and are structured and obviously how the communication processes work. And classical theory is the only theory of organisation that we've looked at so far. However, rest assured, we're going to be doing more. But um, as the slide says, the rational model informed by classical theory is the kind of decision-making process that HR follows, for example. So if you think about um, applying for a job and the way HR actually goes about um, looking for suitable employees. Everything is very systematised, it's very structured, criteria are laid out, so the communication is written, and it comes from the central authority of an organisation. Central authority of an organisation will say, this is the kind of person we want, this is the kind of organisation we have. So you could imagine that kind of structured thinking that's um, defined by the rational model. The optimizing model, 
however, is in contrast, and it's not looking for a single solution. Um, it's regarded as the kind of thinking that happens when someone's been in a role for a long time, they're regarded as an expert, and so they actually think intuitively or they lean on past experience. It's actually quite quick. Um, there is a logical uh, component to it. It's not that it's um, like creative thinking in that it's um, not, not structured, but it is the kind of model that actually defines logical thinking. So customer service, for example, um, follows particular processes and uh, it looks for achieving a desired outcome, which is that the customer is satisfied. So um, just to give you a, um, a different set of examples, I've actually um, applied for jobs in the past that require psychometric testing. I don't know if any of you have done that, but it's the test that's given to you to determine the way you actually think. And it tries to measure the way you would um, work in certain outcomes. And often there are various categories of psychometric testing that try and assess your trustworthiness and things like that. And whether you're kind of a sequential thinker, whether you are good at critical analysis, for example. And, you know, tests are designed in a way to um, delineate people. And obviously there's a lot of criticism of that kind of thing, but it is seen as a you know, useful measure within HR of actually determining what employees are likely to be like. The optimizing model um, apparently came about in the 1960s and is attributed to March and Simon. Um, the reason I'm uh, talking about this is because they talk about a satisficing process, which is a process of just uh, achieving results that are just sufficient, things that suffice. So they don't look for um, ideal rational solutions. They just look for things that are possible and achievable and therefore work in the given circumstances. Satisficing, which is S-A-T-I-S-F-I-C-I-N-G, a satisficing process. So we can talk about a functional theory of group decision making provided by Goran and Hirokawa in 96 because it serves in contrast to Yanis's dysfunctional decision making process, which is groupthink. So there are other dysfunctional uh, models and groupthink is going to be just one of them. So using this functional theory, we can actually talk about um, communication serving particular needs and these being positive ones. Um, there's the clear understanding of the issues. Anyone who's thinking about uh, communication being positive obviously wants to uh, have as a possibility the fact that um, there's a clear benefit to the communication process. It's serving a particular need and it comes from a place of uh, thorough understanding, thorough analysis, understanding the data, understanding the possible outcomes. Um, one of the things that happens in good communication is, of course, that the alternatives are considered. And while they are considered, they're, they're only considered on the basis that they're credible, that they're, you know, probable. Um, and therefore realistic, and also the negative outcomes for various uh, processes would, would need to be thought about in the um, decision-making process. So where an alternative or where an outcome is actually selected, it is the most desirable, it's the most um, attractive, having weighed up all of the possibilities. It doesn't, of course, mean that every decision is going to be a good one, it's just that the process of thinking about it has been um, has been good on the basis that it's a, taken on board all the relevant information, thought through clearly, 
it doesn't it isn't the result of stereotyped thinking and um, therefore it's you know being given the best possible chance of being a good decision Now, we obviously have other kinds of decision-making process beyond the rational, beyond the optimizing. And these are kinds of um, process that uh, we're just going to touch upon. And you can, um, again, think about the ways um, communication is impacted by these kinds of process that actually uh, feed into how decisions are made and how people actually go about making decisions. Um, you may have come across symbolic convergence theory, um, which actually looks at the way um, ideas con uh, converge around things like humour, and often that is achieved through storytelling. So symbolic convergence is actually, um, you know, a theory with uh, some detail, but obviously it's uh, typically associated with the idea of personal narrative and storytelling. Um, but but really, it can be used as a way of um, providing a concept for moving away from task-oriented decision making into into something that maybe leans on emotion, for example. Um, and we can talk about symbolic convergence theory um, that provides us with a power of an anecdote and helps create a feeling of group identity which would impact the way people actually go about um, thinking and making their decisions. They're motivated by, by a story which perhaps has no, uh, logically has no basis for being um, a good reason to decide something and yet it has an impact. Um, the bona fide group's perspective is actually um, one that came about as an approach to research and communication in situ rather than the controlled environments. Uh, and often the controlled environments are places um, of education where you have groups of students who are often used to uh, you know, help researchers kind of model the understandings of uh, thought processes. So um, those or the bona fides group perspective actually generated communication thinking around the ideas of shifting membership, permeable group boundaries and interdependence. So the idea of communication that's actually not as solid uh, and organised in the ways we're thinking, but actually it shifts and um, it has um, overlapping uh, criteria and thinking. So uh, if you think about it in a, let's think about a, a situation that we could think about, um, that we could apply this to rather. So in a medical environment, for example, you're thinking about your health needs uh, when you actually um, consult with healthcare professionals, but you're working with information about your particular health situation, but it's more than just the, the diagnosis and the pain or the, or the health condition, the pathology that's the problem. You're also having to think about how this impacts your family, how this impacts other areas of your life. And so medical decision making is obviously highly complicated and often impacted by the fact that you're having to take on board multiple perspectives, often things that aren't um, just based in kind of logical thinking. So this is our final slide on decision-making processes that uh, come out of research that applies to group and organisation. Um, and we can talk about participation in decision-making uh, in positive ways, because so far in thinking about groupthink, as I said, we've been considering dysfunctional models of thinking or a dysfunctional model of thinking that leads to a negative outcome. So as you will know from your own work in groups and education, the decision making that you do is not only the outcome of collaboration, but you maybe have friendships within that group, 
there are certain kinds of um, personalities in a group, maybe there's expertise in a group, and all of these things have an impact on uh, how the decision making happens. Um, and also there are different kinds of uh, benefits of working in groups as well. Uh, as Groupthink points out, when you actually have good collaboration, when you have that diversity and when um, you incorporate different kinds of thinking, expertise for example, and feedback, the idea is that you're mitigating the funneled thinking. And so we, you know, back to this uh, second metaphor for thinking, which is this uh, kind of creative explosion, this volcanic eruption, if you like. So there are two kinds of models, uh, or two models rather, that come out of this concept of participation in decision making, the effective model and the cognitive model. And one is focused on the idea of generating motivation, and that is when groups actually work well together and you know things are things are working smoothly and uh, it's motivating um, if you think you're either um, achieving your task in a more efficient way because you know people have different kind of expertise and it's helping or you're actually achieving it faster um, because you're sharing the work in some way so that's motivational the cognitive model is focused on um, an improvement in productivity as a result of this kind of shared information, this information flow. So do you remember when we were talking about classical theory, we were talking about the way there's a vertical communication, this um, Scala um, model of communication that goes up a chain for it to be achieved uh, and to help decisions being made. Um, one of the things that Fail spoke of was the impact on horizontal communication, the fact that it doesn't happen as much and therefore impacts innovation. But Fail did come up with this concept of a, a bridge, if you like, for horizontal communication happening. Well, this cognitive model actually looks at the benefits of the information flow, um, but it when it says up and down, it's really up and down a chain. It's not thinking about the hierarchy so much as probably up and down a kind of linear, um, a linear, a linear scale, if you like. Yes. And therefore, we can think about productivity being generated through, you know, uh, shared thinking and um, the positives of that. So thank you. This brings us to the end of what I think has been another fairly deep lecture um, in the sense that we've actually gone into quite some detail about a particular um, topic of thinking in group and organisation. We've looked at dysfunction. We've looked at positive outcomes of good decision making. We've considered the ways in which communication can have a, a, a good impact, i.e. reducing um, the likelihood of groupthink and looked at communication with respect to shared decision making as well. Um, I'm going to leave you with the citations and spend a few moments talking about our query assignment because there have been some uh, emails and questions about it and I want to clarify those issues. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the academic queries that you're going to be writing, of which there are three that make up your portfolio. So here's my best way of explaining it, other than the information that's already out there. Um, one, we're essentially looking at organisation and processes that produce them, of which communication is just one process. So for this course, we need to examine 
structure and process and that's why we're looking at organizational theory and looking at communication that's the only way that we can understand how uh, you know groups and organization works and uh, through that we can then start to talk about the communication processes so research itself will take a theory as its orientation meaning it will use that theory as a way of explaining what is happening uh, in the particular kind of analysis and through that it creates knowledge and a query is a critique of that knowledge and your opinion of what the limitations of that knowledge are is what I'm interested in so what you will need to do is find a paper on organization that either takes a communication lens and if you remember in the first lecture there are seven areas of communication theory that apply to organization that have been uh, laid out. So you could take a communication lens, uh, a paper that takes a communication lens and look at an area of communication within group and organization, if that's your desire. Or you can take an organizational theory lens. And so far we've only looked at classical theory and uh, in today's lecture we've looked at groupthink which is a uh, communication and uh, psychology lens for the way organization uh, and thinking around decision making happens so what you'll do is you'll find your paper um, and that paper will be an application paper meaning it's a paper that uses a theoretical orientation and does a piece of research on an organization, whether it be communication or organizational theory. Then you will find a theory paper based on the theory that you're trying to critique um, and that is being used as leverage to explain what's going on within the organization in that first paper, in that application paper. So you will find many papers as well that critique theory and that is why I said if you find an application paper, a theory paper and a critique paper you will have three papers that will provide you with enough information as a foundation for your query. At, uh, as this course uh, is set out in the course outline the first six weeks are based around theoretical orientations of communication and organization and the processes of organizing. The next six weeks are based around application and so we're going to be looking at doing some research ourselves around communication and organizing and since this course is 100% coursework we have two pieces of coursework for the first six weeks and two pieces of coursework for the second and the query is one of the the query portfolio is one of the pieces of coursework the first six weeks and therefore it is based around your analysis of theory and based around um, your opinions of what we understand about group and organization. I hope that helps. It certainly does flesh out what I've set out in the PDF uh, which is the preamble to writing a query. There's a sample query which as I've said in the announcement is not a template it was merely a way of me trying to explain to you a particular way of structuring um, uh, an outline for your ideas and uh, then there's the rubric which also indicates some of the elements of uh, what or all of the elements rather that you'll be marked according to okay many thanks <laughs>